I wanted to start with the AFL, though. Something a bit different here. They're committed, as of today, to changing its prize for Mark of the Year. Now, this oh. might be well and truly overdue. They've been working through their options in the wake of, you know, who's Mark on Anzac Day, as big as that was, Jamie Elliott, a top end Mackay. But today they confirmed they'd be ramping up the reward for the biggest grab of 2024. So Harry Himmelberg, a lot has been made of this, $10,000 in the kicker. The 12 month supply of pies didn't interest him a lot, and neither did the pie warmer. So he donated the last two to his junior footy clubs. And as good as that is, I don't think it's a prize befitting of the biggest game and the biggest grabs in front of the biggest crowds like we saw over the weekend. So the last time the AFL awarded a card, Jared and Kane, to the mark of the year and goal of the year in the same year, you have to go back to 2001 when Gary Moorcroft Gee. stood atop your mate Brad Johnson. They got the that car was, that, that was year. That was worthy of a big car, that one. Oh. Well, it's amazing that it's ridiculous. And we've it's been all, that long. I think everyone would agree. I yeah, mean, the, the, the market has got hold of this and just destroyed it. Uh, the stock market? Or? No, the marketers. <laughs> oh, the market. marketers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, they, they didn't see it for what it was. <laughs> no. They saw it as an opportunity and uh, to get well, somebody else in like, rather than giving the car out. And a lot, yeah, I mean, maybe now with Virgin well and truly on board. I mean, there's some great well, symmetry there with the, well, with the marketers. Well, yeah. I mean, they're taking flight. They can get a flight. Give them an around the world ticket or something as a, we, as a prop. We gave Zach Butters a hundred thousand dollar Lexus on the Sunday Footy Show last year, like, yeah. and we're doing it again this year. Like, come on, they can come mm. up with something. The, no, the, and the money is flush in the game. Sponsors like never before. coming out of their backside. Yeah. Uh, injury news. Yeah, the Bulldogs are struggling at three and four. So Cody Waitman, this is another blow for the doggies. Unfortunately, surgery. This is always going to be the likely outcome on that left elbow. They just kept popping out. So three it's dislocations. It's dislocated, I think, in round two. Three. Yep. Yeah. Two in the last month. Three in the last. Inside the last two years. Yeah. So that it's, in many ways, it's forced he and the club's handy. So he's going to go under and off. It's at least six weeks. So scans this morning. The advice was, let's just keep this thing in the socket and get this done once and for all. So he's done. But he's done, of course, in the same week that Riley West has been forced really to accept that one match Surprised sanction as well. I'm not because... As much as I think there might have been some empathy for Riley West in that it was a legitimate shepherd, he's unlucky. I don't think he deliberately meant to get him high. There was no malice, as we say. But the player's been concussed, and there's only so many avenues that clubs can choose to go down. So they decided not to. In the end, what does it do? We know they're going to – well, we think they're going to get Jamari Eagle-Hagen back. We think they're going to get Tom Liberatore back, which was curious. A really violent and sudden onset of gastro. He made the flight over. Mm. was all good to go the night before. And then during the night, absolutely no good. So Bad those prawn. two will come back. Yeah, maybe. Dodgy prawn at the buffet. He's cap, um, got another one. Charlie Clark's the one to keep an eye on, though. The lively um, goal sneak that they recruited in the 2022 draft. Um, pick 24, I think he was. Been in pretty good form in the VFL. So as they evolve under Luke Beveridge, maybe he's the next one to get uh, a look in there. I reckon they need another crummer, seriously, mm. because uh, Waitman's almost a small tall. And I like him... I, th I think they've got so many of that uh, type. They need some more presence on Must the deck. Admit, I like I like West. I think he's improved. Yeah, yeah. A lot. He has this so year. That's a, yep. a big blow for them. Albeit, it's Hawthorne this week, isn't it? It is. So um, that. It is. So St Kilda go in the tribunal tomorrow night. So this is Jack Higgins, a three-match dangerous tackle. Aaliyah Aaliyah's foul concussion test in the aftermath. Had Michael Christian, he could only assess it as severe. That's the threshold. It was going to be always careless and it was always going to be um, rough conduct. So that's the three-match trigger. Really hard to say. I'm not sure how they can argue it down. I know Adrian Anderson's got the skeleton key when it comes to these sort of things. Has he got I'm told, the case? I'm told he has Hello. the case. So if he's on, uh, if he's on the case, back. Jared, yep, strap yourself in for a lively night. Don't think he's eligible for the good bloke card. So Adrian's going to have to get really creative here. But um, look, it, it would appear to be all or nothing here, given the boxes that have to be ticked. But we'll wait and see. Just on the Saints, their fourth uh, running with the law this year, so to speak, given they've had Jimmy Webster go up, Max King, Marcus Windhager, and now Higgins. The reinforcements are well and truly on the way, though. Mason Wood is a chance. Ben Patton's a chance. Paddy Dow's a chance. Max King's a chance. And you know who else is a chance to return this week? Jimmy Webster, after the seven-match suspension, of course, he's returning or slated to return against North Melbourne, where it all started for He'd him. He'd be going back through the twos, though, wouldn't he? Well, I'm told he's fit. He's done all the okay. training as an older player, and we see it more and more in the modern day. We saw Cam Guthrie yeah, come back at the weekend. I saw they Luke Parker go beat. through the twos. I don't think Webster's in the Guthrie calibre. But St but Kilda aren't spoiled for choice. True. So it'll be interesting to see how they go with bringing a mature player back. Yep. I say they need him, but we'll see how they go with it anyway. Right, and Marbio Chol, of course, the news today, uh, one match, rough conduct. Um, and that was off the ball against Errol Gould. And that's the Charlie Ballard situation. The shove that slips high is intentional, even though it's low impact. So that's the one match trigger for that. Rory Sloan, terrific speaking about mm. the decisions on his retirement, what he's next and, 
uh, reflecting on what has been an outstanding career. He was a tough competitor, Hodgie. Yeah, spot on. Uh, if, if you knew, uh, you, whenever you were coming up against Rory, it was always going to be a fierce battle. Uh, what was he, 250-odd games? Mm. Uh, I was surprised he only had one All-Australian. For someone who, I think, twice finished in the top 10 in the in the Brownlow medal, um, he was so consistent for so long. Um, it's just disappointing on, on how he finished his great career, not being able to, I guess, go out playing, having through through this in, eye injury. But, um, look, well done for, for what he was able to do over a long a long time at the LA Football Club. All right, a word on your Hawks, because, once again, not for the first time this year, Sammy Mitchell looked incredibly frustrated yesterday. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, I guess the spray that he gave for a couple of the boys at quarter time, you um, yeah, you had to sort of sit back and go, why would you be a coach? Mm. But you could understand why he was frustrated because looking around, a lot of the stats there, they were actually going okay mm. as far as contested possession, um, clear that that kind of stuff in the middle. Mind you, I don't, I don't mind the the look of Meek as well. He's an aggressive, old fashioned ruckman. Uh, but you, if you're sitting there as coach watching and your pl- your, your players are doing so much right, but then it was just the conversion. Um, if you look at, I think, halfway through the, th- the last quarter, they were leading the inside 50s, 47 to 37. And then Sydney, in, in junk time, um, ended up getting 13 in the last half a quarter when Hawthorne didn't have any. But if you actually watch the game, you could see why he was so angry because they were doing so much right. But the other thing in sport, the top-end talent that they don't have there at the moment, they just couldn't convert. And Sydney, just when they got through... It's also a little bit of Sydney as well. How good Sydney are looking there. Both Sydney sides are looking extremely good at the moment. How do you see that game? I know it's off script, but how do you see that game coming up? Because to me, I think the Giants, all their numbers are in the premiership window. The Swans are doing it slightly different. Um, and it's going to be a really good audit for, I think, more so the Swans than for the Giants. Uh, look, I, I'm pretty bullish. I tipped Sydney at the start of the year, but yep. watching what the Giants are able to do, I did the game in Canberra on yep. Thursday night. And they scary, weren't they? They came in at half time and looked. It looked pretty. It looked. It was an even contest. Uh, and then all of a sudden, they just they just clicked. All, uh, the Lions could not connect going inside Ford Fifty. In fairness, that they haven't been able to do that all year, but uh, definitely against the the GW side. But what I saw was was effort, speed. They looked so quick. They made the mm. Lions look like old men out in the footy field. But their their transition, their work rate, their hunt to tackle. Um, they they were they were very impressive. Like that that second half was was an onslaught. I think they had scored on by 50, 60 points. It was yeah. it was a shellacking, but it, it's going to be a ripping game. Um, what is it? The the battle of the bridge. The battle of the bridge. Uh, yeah, yeah, don't call it the battle of the bridge. That. That's what we call the battle of the bridge. But nevertheless, uh, they made the 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 lions look slow, but the lions made the lions look slow as well. Hodgy, there was you know half a dozen players that you're just looking and saying, Where, "Where's your effort?" Yeah, I think when you when you they they look confused. They look lost at the moment. And I think a lot of it's to do with their ball movement. The transition from the lines. You look at what the lines have been able to do. They're, they're normally a very good, uh, highly skilled side where they put it to, to the favour of their of their talented forward line. But they just wasted the ball. Like, if you look at the stats throughout the year, they've had the most uh, inside 50 differential out of any club. Mm. So they're sitting number one out of any club. And they're sitting here 2-5. Yep. So what that says is the, the connection from the mids going into the forwards, the forwards are either not running to the right areas, the kicks aren't going to their favour. There was a lot of disposals going inside their forward 50 on Thursday night, which was just in favour of the defence. And then they, there was no, I think they had four inside 50 tackles for, for the whole game, where if you look at Harvey Thomas, who'd played seven games, he had more than him, he had five. Cadman, who'd played 19 games, has had four. So, yes, they look confused. Yes, the connection's not there. But it looks like the, the will to hunt, um, that, that definitely wasn't there because the young kids from Giants definitely outclassed the, the lines in that area. Harvey's got to take out his driver's licence to go into a bar. He looks about 14. <clears throat> I saw him after the game. I thought it was a spectator walking yeah. through. I thought it was a kid <laughs> walking through. He looked like – you just spot on. He looked like he was 14 or 15. Yeah. He had the light, shaved little side. Yeah, that's do, right. But the height of him – but tell you what, you put him on the footy field – um, geez, he was impressive. His his effort and, and will and, and I, I can see why they why they picked him. Such a young fella. All right, Hodgie, uh, North Melbourne, and there's been some discussion mm. around how to get them better. There's big expose in the Herald Sun again, and everyone's scratching their heads at how long this is going to take. What's your view over this discussion? Do you are you guys a fan of a priority pick and a high one at that? Not not a, not a mid second round or a, or, a, or a start of third. That, that's that's irrelevant. That's nothing. Right at are the pointy guys, end. Right at the pointy end, just, old like, school just like Kane when he gets on a plane and turns left, he goes straight to the pointy end. I, I like picks that they can try to get senior players in because at this stage, 
They don't need another kid that's going to take five years. They need some genuine players who are going to give them structure. Now, the question is, are they going to be able to get those players to come to their club? Well, well that, if they've that, got a big if they've got a big checkbook, that's yeah. probably the only way. Because if if you're looking if you're looking at what they're doing, well, they're, they're ranked number seventeen for scoring and defending scores. If you mm. look at every game this year, they've had a hundred points kicked against them. And I'll go through a couple of teams since two thousand that have had that. Two thousand, St Kilda did it. They got a priority pick and got rewalk. Did that change the St Kilda's future going forward? Yes, it did. Two thousand eight, Melbourne had 100 points kicked against them in their first seven games. They got a priority pick. Mid-tier, didn't have as much effect. Richmond in 2010. And then these other ones, 2011 was Gold Coast, an expansion club who had filled with young young kids. 2013, GWS, expansion club. And then Melbourne in 2013, when this is when all the tanking stuff. So they got nothing because it was all the tanking from 2008 and 2009. I'm sitting here going that North are a young team. They may, yes, they may have made a few mistakes early and, and cut too many senior players to teach these young guys. But if you look back at a team that's can't score, they can't defend. They need as much help as they possibly can get. It's it's time they, they've been down the bottom for too long, and it's not just being down the bottom. They've been embarrassing as far mm. as their scores, their win loss. You can't keep a football club, especially a club. Didn't you that argue don't last week though against base. priority picks? No, no, I was not. I was huh? not a no. I've, so th- I've been I've been on the side of that for a long period. We want this side actually having a bit of hope. So where does Hall thought that the only query to that is North had pick one in 2021. Now he's not there anymore. They also had pick one in 2022. Now they traded that, and they got a couple of picks for that. They got a compensation pick which was overs for Mackay at three. There's a heap of first round picks on their Ten. list already. Ten of them. Where does someone like Hawthorne fit? Like they, to to that argument, you're better off. For the Hawks just to lose every week and then get because they don't have really I think they've got maybe one or two top five picks on their list. Yeah, but so where does it? Where, how would they feel about that? If if you've got a coach who's telling the players to go out there and lose, then you don't have the right coach for your football club. North North Melbourne have tried everything to go out there and win. They've tried new coaches. They've tried cut the list. They've tried. They they got the best pick in the draft, but then he wanted to go home. So as much as they tried to hold him, they let him. He they let him go home and got two picks for it. Um, Hawthorne, they're not going to get a priority pick for how long because of the success that they've had. But I'm just looking back. So North Melbourne would have been down the bottom for that long. They need they need as much help as they can get. And it's not a second round priority pick because a second round could be a hit and a miss. They need something at the pointy end. That, as Jared said, that they either trade, if they get a top three or four, where they can trade to a club yep. to get a big person who's going to drive the culture of that football club. But they need something. We can't just let them sit back because it seems like that's what, what's been happening and, and they haven't been able to jump up the ladder. So what, this is a question for all three of you because the kids are going to keep coming in, whether they like it or not, by virtue of the fact that's how the draft works. Mm. The kids are going to keep coming in. So I don't want to embarrass Luke Hodge here, but everyone says, I'll go out and get a, a Luke Hodge. And obviously they're hard to get. And I don't reckon Mel, uh, North Melbourne have nailed there. So... Shields, yeah, um, Greenwood. Greenwood hasn't quite worked. Core hasn't worked. Logue. Logue's injured. So Melbourne, Fisher. I thought, when you look back at Melbourne, they nailed theirs. They got Daniel Cross in. He just had a bit a bit more grunner. He had some footy left in him. Bernie Vince was good for Lewis a few years as well. Jordan Lewis as well. So I don't reckon North have nailed that. So if I'm North Melbourne, I am scouring the competition at the moment. And I'm going to someone like a, a Jackson McRae at the Western Bulldogs. And you say, why would he go there? Well, the checkbook means he would go there. The opportunity means he would go there. And maybe the dogs, if you're being harsh, are they going to get back there in his time? So you've won a flag there anyway. Do you go for someone like a Mitch Duncan? Really hard to prize out of Geelong. Pendlebury. Pendlebury. Um, side bottom might be f- closer to finish than not. So do you scale the competition looking for those guys to help? Maybe you're undoing a mistake too. You've cut too hard. Now you're re- Can I it. ask you, Hodgie, what, what is important for the person going to that role? And you're the uh, best the, to speak about this. Uh, the person who goes that has to put the side in front of himself. So they can't go there and expect them to be the best player they can be. They can't go there to expect to get 20, 25 touches. They've got to play in a position to, if you walk off the ground, you've had five touches, mm. but you've helped a kid te- and you've taught a kid and gave advice to a kid on how for him to develop. That's the mindset you have to go there. So I, I don't think you can do that with an outside midfielder. I, I think the person that you have to go and get in North Melbourne, it's got to be someone who can see the play from behind, mm. a, a defender who can set up play, can talk to the mids, can tell them when they're spreading, tell them when to squeeze in, tell them when to drop back, or, or an inside mid that can actually show these guys what to do. If you're on the outside, you're relying on a lot of players to have an impact out there. So, And you're not really voicing or, or setting people up from the outside. 
Uh, so that would be the people, that I'd, if I was North Melbourne, it would be a senior person who could float across the half-back line and help him out or be a bull in the middle to set the tempo for the young guys. Callum Ward is another one I just thought of. Yeah, he'd be, he'd be a ripper. Right. One of the things they need to do, Hodgie, is they've got to stop the talent drain out of the place because if, if they lose Surha and then they lose LDU the following year, then this rebuilding process is going to go on and on and on. Yeah, that, that's the harder thing for the, the senior blokes at North Melbourne is how many times have they gone through this yeah. hoping that we're going to get back up and then you yeah. sit back and go, oh, geez, we're going through it again. Um, so I, I can yeah. understand. I hope I hope the guys stick around because everyone knows that if they can stick around together and get them back up the top, that would be so much more rewarding than going to another club and, and doing it there. Um, but you can understand why they are contemplating because football, as we just saw, we spoke to Rory Sloan. He's yeah. just retired, 255 games, made it to a grand final once, and we thought, hey, and they're going to be back for a few years. They had a really good list. Didn't get back there again. So a, a football career is only for a short period of time. You need to make make your chance while, while you're there playing. But I, I hope that those players don't leave, but you can understand why they are contemplating it. Ron's got a message for you, Hodgie. Hodgie, <laughs> the Saints haven't won a flag in 58 years. <laughs> Screw North Melbourne priority picks. <laughs> Give St yep. Kilda a handout, Kane. What do you think? I'm with you, Ron. I'm right <laughs> behind you, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> so no, that's, just, that's... just for the record, Oji, you're saying a pick right at the front of the draft. Oh, I, I think they need that, and that's where, as Jared said, if they if they trade it off to try and get, because you, yeah. you're not going to trade off a pick twenty twenty five and get a good player in. Not someone who's going to change the culture or change the standards or put the team in front of himself. The, someone who they need. Oof. So they need something high up the top. And I can understand the St Kilda supporters, but they've had success. They've had a couple grand grand final appearances. They've had finals. They've they've been competitive for for a number of years. North Melbourne haven't. And this is what I think is it, it doesn't look good on the game, and you sort of sit back at a North Melbourne supporter going, "Geez, when are we going to go?" This is why they're, they're a team that doesn't have a big sponsorship or membership anyway, and this isn't helping the case. I think to that St Kilda supporter who texted in with the "screw you," I think that's exactly <laughs> what the St Kilda president Andrew Bassett uh, has passed on to the commission, <laughs> probably about this particular issue. Seventeen other presidents too, probably. To be fair, to I would say. Have thought so. uh, yeah, we, we know we know Andrew Bassett. He, he doesn't pull his punches. <laughs> if he thinks that, he'll definitely say it to him. Let's move on to the uh, the lines, Hodgy, because that third quarter and and it's been sort of one quarter every week that has let them down in their losses. So they've conceded five goals in most of their losses in one particular quarter, and the game that you did was was Thursday night. Nathan Buckley had some interesting things to say about the coach and the way and the way that he coaches this morning. He sort of says that he's he's all in with the players, like he's a players coach, not dissimilar to to Craig McRae. He's alongside of them; they're all in it together. He relies on the effort, and then once you lose that effort, you don't really have anywhere to go because you feel let down by the players that you've been so invested in. Do you think he's feeling the pressure, Fags? And and how have you assessed your lines? Uh, I think anyone at the football club would be would be feeling that a little bit, considering everyone had high hopes for him. You come off a grand final, lost by four points, and then you're, you're sitting here two and five. And yes, they've played some good teams. I've actually got them, looking at the schedule going mm. forward, I've got them winning the next four games. Yep, same. So they're going to come through. If, if they do what they should do, and they probably haven't done that so far this year, but if they, if they do what they should do, they should be sitting six and five coming into their break. And then all of a sudden you're sitting and going, are they a good enough team? Though, If they can win the home games from then, they're, they're, they're going to have enough chances to make those finals. So I don't think it's all doom and gloom, but no doubt every person on the list and, and all the coaches will be sitting back going, how can we how can we tweak this to motivate the guys? Because there's there's clearly some, some issues out in the field with the connection side of things, that their transition, the ball movement. As I said, the stat I gave before about getting being number one in the AFL for differential inside 50, you're getting the ball, you're putting it in there, but just... Mm. That, that final kick, which we all know is the hardest kick in football, that's not connecting. And when you've got blokes up where Danaher, Hitwood, um, Charlie Cameron, Rayner, these kind of guys, they're a talented fall on. They're too talented to, to have this happen to them consistently over the first seven games. There's a lot of uh, clubs in the last couple of weeks. They've both put some heavy pressure on Lockie Neal, and uh, it's, it's unraveled them a little bit. It's unraveled Lockie to a degree, and it's unraveled them because they're not getting the free flow. Yeah, it is, and you can see Lockie is getting uh, fairly frustrated. But you sort of do sit back, and it's the old, it's the old tags. When Cal Ward got under his skin on the weekend, but mm. the umpires only paid the free kick again. I think the umpires need to be a bit smarter with if a person getting tag reacts a little bit, you've mm. got to give a little bit of leeway because there is a reason why he's doing this. If they they miss all the ones where he's getting the bumps, and and this happens in all teams, not just with Lockie, but I think the umpire needs to be smarter because. There was one that Lockie gave away against Carl Ward, but up the other end, about five minutes earlier, Lockie got dropped as well. So, uh, look, back with the with the Lions, there. 
one big part of their game with their dropped away is their turnover zone. I know mm. we spoke a bit about the connection, but their, their turnovers, they were number one last year for points from turnover. They're sitting 17th this year. That's a big drop for a team who was everyone had up at the top of the ladder. So it doesn't take much. They're a good enough team to, to change a few things and be more efficient going forward, but also the defensive side of things and, and turning the ball over is a big factor for them as well. Uh, TJ Chompers-Jones yesterday on the Sunday Footy Show, Sammy, had a, a really good point about player access with the media, and I'll bring you in a sec, Hodge, because you work for the host broadcast of Channel 7 and you too, Jared, with Fox. Has there been any changes from your observation, Sammy, with the extra media access was supposed to be granted from the players where every player is supposed to be available <laughs> to the media pretty much straight after, wasn't it? Correct mm. me if I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah straight after different? the game. Not especially. Nothing. There's a bit more transparency around injury to be fair. And I know that was a big bugbear of the AFL as well. So you'll notice now on a Tuesday, everyone's injury list is, is laid out in full and there's transparency. I think when we're watching the games as well, but in terms of access, I think it's one the where the clubs... still rolling at the short-term, medium term. No, no, no to be fair to them, they're not. So I think there's been improvement in that regard, which is what the fans probably care about the most, is when, when's the player going to be available? Acknowledging it can be an inexact science at times and there's setbacks and the like. I think the access thing is one where the clubs will sit back. They're not going to be proactive if they're asked. Mm. Then they're, and it's not a hard and fast rule. If, if they say no for a few weeks, then it might come across the AFL's desk. And the clubs do get sweated on it by the AFL, to be fair. Um, and a couple of clubs have had, not a slap on the wrist, but a little nudge that, come on, you need to be providing a players with a... So Jared? the clubs would probably say they're being held to account. Jared, I haven't noticed any change, and I can tell you now, the man who brought his best on ground medal from uh, the twos, trying yeah. to work his way into the one, Sammy Watson, super producer, he would say, argue, it's no Nothing. easier getting players. Well, what are Channel 7 saying, if anything, Hodgie? Uh, but being the Friday night... I th yeah. unless Do you see his producer. medal, Hodgie? Do you see Sammy's medal? No, I didn't. I okay, didn't see we'll, it. We'll no. give you a look at it. Oh, send, send me through a photo. I didn't okay. see it. Um, but I, yeah. I uh, oh, he's back. unless he's... the producers, the producers are the ones that always go and speak to him. But we've yeah. always found that the access on a Friday night has been pretty good. good. So yeah. we've had times in the past where I know that when I was doing um, the boundary stuff during COVID, you'd go out there and talk to players, and they'd say, "No, I didn't want an in interview." Um, where now they're they're more accepted. They realise. I know they do the roaming Brian, and they go into the rooms, and players yeah. uh, are more open to go and have a chat, and they're talking to families and that. So, um, I think that from a from a Friday night uh, point of view, it seems to be going okay. And players, we, we've we've been able to interview mo uh, many players before games. So. Um, that's that's from and <laughs> I haven't had to go through the clubs and, and talk. That's the producer's role, but we've seen like, the access has been okay. Richmond are a long way from the prime time darlings now, but you can't help but wonder if they still were a blockbuster time slot Dusty. favorite. Dusty, <laughs> I don't know what his voice sounds like. How would he navigate it? <laughs> well, he'd probably just say stuff. You buggy, change the rules, and if you want to sack me, fine, fine, hey, find me. Oh, gee, what about the golf swing of Aaron? Completely off topic here. The golf swing of Aaron Phillips is she one of the most talented sports people ever? So that, that she gave played? me the sh Kane, did, didn't it? To be honest, that gave me the <laughs> sh So, do, she do you want to explain there. for those that missed it? Oh, she, with uh, with Live Golf over in Adelaide, they got Aaron to go out there and play a, a round on the Wednesday with some players. And she, we were sort of speaking to her, just saying, oh, have you played much golf? She goes, nah, nah, I haven't really played. I had one lesson, but yeah, I, I don't have time. I've got four kids. <laughs> and then she they put up a photo of, or a video of her swing. It's a perfect swing. Mm. It just gives you, for everyone out there who's been playing golf two or three times a week for, for years, and we look like we're trying to chop a tree down. And then mm. she picks up the golf club and just effortlessly hits it down the middle. Um, Honestly, like, check out her someone... socials. She won the longest drive. Uh, and her swing, not, not that I'm an expert here, but it is flawless. Um, so that, that was unbelievable. And then at halftime of the, the game on Friday night, was it what's the golfer's name? Is it Henrik Stenson? Oh, Stenson. Yeah. 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 Stenson. So I thought it was a, just on the car for that. Game. I just thought it was a fan out of the crowd. So I'm watching it. What's going on here? You now they get <laughs> the basketball. They just get a fan to shoot from halfway. I'm thinking, this, is, this is a fan. <laughs> he's a good golf. golf. <laughs> and he's nailed it from the goal yeah. square to the center circle. And he's hit the pin. And if you hit the pin, a uh, member from the crowd gets a car. Oh, oh got an MG. So yeah. you can't get a car for winning Mark of the Year at the moment. But I know, and then yeah. I realised he's actually a professional, but still, <laughs> it was unbelievable. Hodgie, question without notice. If there wasn't a table and you were uh, in the Michael Christian role, how many games would you give Jack Higgins? Oh, this this is a tough one. Because um, you, you, you feel for him because of the, the what Aaliyah was, was doing was trying to kick the ball and it took yep. all the strength away. If, if Aaliyah had been trying to drive through yep. uh, the tackle, there's no way that force he would have been thrown to the ground. But on the flip side, Aaliyah's trying to kick the ball, so you can't blame him at it. Uh, and this is where you feel for Jack. If you go through the, the categories, I'd be giving it a little bit leaner 
uh, lenient than the three or four. I'd be probably giving it a two because you still have to look after the player with the ball. His arm was still pinned. He still hit the head and yep. the lear went off. So because of all the force and that, but you feel for Jack because of the situation. So you're this a two? Not, Kane, I'll, what would I'll you give two. him? Uh, one. Yeah, I'll give him one. If there was no. And to, no table. To, to all the AFL tribunal heroes out there that correct everyone that speaks about the, the, the case, we're just talking. If there's no table on gut feel, how many would you give yeah. them? And, and, and this is because of everyone who's played, everyone who's played the game or, or trying, to, trying to kick the ball, you could understand that it, if it was a, a normal tackle dump, yep, give me a four, give me a three, four, no problems at all. But this is this was had a contributing a, factor. A, didn't a, it? a bloke yeah. who's about sixty, a bloke who's about eighty kilos, trying to tackle a bloke who's probably ninety five kilos, and then because he's trying to kick the ball, it's taken all his strength away, which allowed Jack to tackle him the way he did. So it is a tough one, but you can understand why the AFL have given him the three because of the table and the graph. No table two because mm. Ali's only got two choice in that situation. Well, he's got three, but holding the third the one's not viable. It's holding the ball. He's got a kick or he's going to handball. Yeah. So he, he has to be allowed to do one of those things. Mm. He just tried to kick the pill and got his head slammed in the turf. But some empathy with Higgins, but I'd go with two without the table. Be fascinating. Jared, a Frio back. Not, not yet, but there are some positive signs. Fife is, isn't he? Oh, Fife was definitely back. But I thought there were signs of Fife uh, doing better earlier in the season. 17 yeah, clearances? It was massive, wasn't oh, it? Sarong, it was strong 17. Sarong. Fife had about Sarong. nine. But I think what we did see sure? was we saw just if they can sort of get their ball movement even to a higher level, handball forward more like we did, corridor more like we saw on the weekend, mm. you know, I think that they can make a real run this year. I, I think their list is so talented that, uh, you know, and this isn't, with hindsight, this is uh, something I thought at the start of the season. I, I think they can be a force this year and even win a final. So they asked me yesterday on the Sunday footy show, do I think Essendon will make that? I said no. And I just said it sort of flippantly, no. And then they're like, in the ad break, they're going, well, well, hang on, what you said Essendon won't make the A. How can you say that? And I'm going, well, Collingwood aren't in there at the moment. Brisbane aren't in there at the moment. Gold Coast aren't in there at the moment. And I think those teams are better. Now, would you have Essendon in the eight right for the end of the year? I think they're a really good chance. They've sorted out their defence. So it's oh, impossible you... to say yes or no, but they are a genuine chance. If they continue to play like they are, then they'll make the eight. Hodgie? Uh, I've seen the good and the bad of Essendon. Mm. I saw the bad against Port Adelaide. Mm. Uh, if they can limit those performances, I could see them making the eight because how they responded against the Western Bulldogs the following week was a, a top eight performance. There's mm. no doubt about it. But it's that that's the, the hardest thing for Essendon is that consistency. You can't keep throwing up one of those every now and then. And they've responded the right way, the way they fought it out against Collingwood, who I, I feel that Collingwood are starting to get back to their best. Um, but I'd, I'd have them on the verge of the, the eight this year. Good yeah. draw. Yeah, uh, the good draw. But I think there's going to be some good teams to miss out is what you're trying to say. Mm. Because if Gold Coast, Gold Coast draw is amazing. Uh, Collingwood aren't in there at the moment. Brisbane aren't you, in there. Did you view the Darcy-Jackson combo? Uh Luke Jackson hasn't had a clearance since Sean Darcy has come back in. Yeah. So no issue with Jackson's form. My issue is Darcy the played better. playing. Yeah. Because he was around the ball more. It was, it, it, who's, who's the best Ruckman, Jackson or Darcy? I think Jackson's we know, we know the better Ruckman. They're, they're playing in this position because Jackson's a clearly a better forward than Darcy. But Correct. But who, who would be the best Ruckman out of the two of them? And this is, this is the discussion yeah. that, we're, that we're having. 